Hello, everyone. And welcome to Chaucer's virtual author book discussion with explorer, climber, conservationist, and author Rick Ridgway. My name is Michael Takuchi. I'm the events coordinator at Chaucer's Books, a 47 year old independent bookstore located in Santa Barbara, California. To purchase The Life Live Wild, browse other books, or check out our upcoming events, please go to our website, chaucersbooks.com. Speaking of upcoming events, this Thursday, we welcome Los Angeles writer Natasha Dion, who will speak virtually on her hit novel, The Perishing. We'll follow that up with the in-store events for Ginny Weber on December 9th, Roger Drilling on December 13th, and photographer Mike Eliason on the 14th. All of event, those events beginning at 5.30 p.m. While our guests and I are the only ones seen and heard on this webinar, please feel free to utilize the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen. Tonight's event is being simulcasted on and recorded for our YouTube channel and will be available to view after program's completion. YouTubers, if you're, if you're out there, um, if you wanna ask questions, please use the chat function and I will be monitoring during Rick's presentation. So let's begin. I'm gonna push the little record button here and we're beginning. All right. My, my first introduction to Rick Ridgway was a book, via a book he wrote 30 plus years ago with Dick Bass and Frank Wells titled Seven Summits. It was an introduction of, my, of outdoor living for me and it was an amazing book that got into the lives of those who risked much in the name of adventure. Rick is an amazing man. He's called the Indiana Jones by Rolling Stone magazine. He doesn't sh shy away from unknown territory, as said. In fact, he seeks it. Rick is recognized as one of the world's foremost mountaineers. He was part of the 1978 team that were the first Americans to summit K2, the world's highest, second highest mountain. And he has climbed new routes and explored little known regions on six continents. Ridgway is also an environmentalist, a writer, photographer, filmmaker, and businessman. For 15 years beginning in 2005, he oversaw environmental affairs at the outdoor clothing company, Patagonia. Yay, Patagonia. Before joining Patagonia, he was owner president of Adventure Photo and Film, a leading stock photo and film agency. He has authored six books and dozens of magazine articles and produced or directed many documentary films. He was honored by National Geographic with the Lifetime Achievement Adventure Award and was awarded the Lowell Thomas Award by the Explorers Club. Rick serves on the boards of Tompkins Cons Conservation and the Turtle Conservancy. He currently lives in Ojai, so please welcome Rick Ridgway. Thank you, Michael. It's uh, really a pleasure to, to join you this evening and uh, a welcome to everybody who's uh, tuned in. Well, it's a pleasure to all ours, Rick. And I have to say, I don't take my word for it, but I think Jimmy Chin wrote your your good friend Jimmy Chin and he says the most poignant memories of, of your legendary career as an explorer, climber, and conservationist, but mostly as an extraordinarily observant and compassionate human being, which is told in Life Lived Wild. And Jimmy also adds that you you capture the essence of a lifetime of storytelling. I think that's high praise indeed from somebody so accomplished as Jimmy. <laughs> Well, I try to live up to that one. Before we begin with your presentation, I have to ask you though, um, you've done so much, but why now? And, and why did you decide to write this book now? I'm curious. Well, Jimmy Chin actually had a lot to do with that. Um, I was down in Patagonia, the place, Southern South America, mm -hmm. working on one mm -hmm. of Chris Tompkins projects with Jimmy and we were on our way back uh, and between flights in the Santiago airport, I was recounting some of my stories, uh, the ones I'll share with the audience tonight. And, okay. and he said, whoa, that's incredible. Do you have any photographs? And I said, well, I do. 
Uh, in fact, I'll be showing you guys some of those photos tonight. And he said, you got to start an Instagram account. And you know, a couple of beers later, by the time we got on our flight, I had an Instagram account, thanks to him. And I started posting photos with little stories. And my middle daughter, Cameron, who works at Patagonia as a photo editor, following in her late mother's footsteps, <clears throat> convinced me to uh, turn the Instagram account into a book. Uh, and that was the, the, how the whole process started. So I guess that's kind of a long answer to why now. <laughs> but, oh, it's, wow. It's an incredible book, but I told you earlier, I had to stop reading it because I wanted to hear your voice and be able to read the book in your voice, which shines throughout the whole book. And the people you meet, the things you've done have been incredible, but I think what really stands out to me are the people you've met along the way and the good friends you've met along the way. Great. Well, thank you. Um, I decided for the evening that, you know, I think maybe unlike a lot of authors events where they uh, mm -hmm. read from their book, I uh, decided to just do a very short reading from the prologue. But then um, I'm going to give all of you tonight a little bit of an old fashioned slideshow. <laughs> of course it's digital, so it's, you know, it's not a slideshow, but that's what it feels like to me. And um, I also, because we now have technology that allows me to do it, I've added a few film clips because I've, over the years I've been involved in filming a lot of the trips I've been on. So I've got little clips in here, including some from K2 that have never really been seen before. Oh. We have some old, we just really, you know, we, we had a, a home movie eight millimeter camera with us and we and we, <sighs> we filmed some of the climb and that film was just locked in a drawer for decades. Uh, but somebody, one of the team members digitized it and uh, sent it around to us. And I've got clips from there that I've really just seen for the first time, even a few weeks ago, putting this together. Uh, so I thought that would be a fun, uh, it's not an exact representation of the book, but it is, stories about, uh, very short stories uh, illustrated with slides and film clips about many of the expeditions that I do talk about in the book. Wow. So that's what I've got for us this evening. Wow, so let's get started. I'm gonna block myself out and take it away, Rick. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen and go into the presentation. Speak slowly while, hold on. I don't think that worked. Give me one more try here. Now, Michael, let me do a check and ask you how that looks. Okay. That looks great, looks good. So here's this uh, reading from the prologue uh, of my memoir, Life Lived Wild. I once calculated that I've spent over five years total time sleeping in tents, and most of that in small tents pitched in the world's most remote regions. I say that not to boast, but to offer it as a measure of time spent deeply connected to wildness, because that connection has shaped the way I've lived my life, teaching me to distinguish what I call matters of consequence from matters of inconsequence. Now, I'm assuming all of you here tonight could benefit from knowing better how to separate things that are consequential from things that aren't. And if you think about it, you might come to the same conclusion I have that it's as about it as important a life skill as any of us could own. And I'm not claiming that I've got it totally figured out by any means, but because because I'm on a journey just like everybody tuning in tonight. And it's a journey that started when I was a young teenager and my Mother gave me a subscription to National Geographic and I read a cover story about the first American ascent of Mount Everest. Now this was in 1963 and inside was this photograph of Jim Whitaker uh, and Nawang Gambu, uh, Jim the first American to reach the summit and I decided that's who I wanted to be. So I bought an ice axe and crampons just like Jim Whitaker's and an instruction manual how to use my new gear and, and that made my mother's maternal radar kind of start to bleep. So for my high school graduation present, she sent me to Outward Bound uh, in the Oregon Cascades. And I learned some basic mountaineering skills. And 
And there I was more hooked than ever. So that after college, I used every dollar I could earn doing odd jobs uh, to climb in places like Yosemite. And I also started going to Peru, where I learned the fundamentals of high altitude mountaineering. And, and I met another climber uh, more experienced than me named Chris Chandler. And, and Chris took me under his wing. Then a year later, he called to say that he'd gotten both of us on an expedition to the Himalayas. And I said, whoa, the Himalayas, like that was my dream to figure out how to get to the highest range in the world. What's the mountain? I asked him. And he paused for a minute, which I realized later was for effect before he said Everest. <laughs> and I remembered that National Geographic article I'd read when I was in my early teens and, and that photo of my hero, Jim Whitaker on the summit. And, and here I was at age 25 following in his footsteps. Well, the expedition was filmed for a television special and the camera crew followed Chris and me through the Kumbu icefall. And that's the most dangerous part of the climb. And today Sherpas put the route in for clients who, you know, you know, can pay over a hundred grand just to say they've climbed Everest. But back then we had to figure it out for ourselves. 1247, September 2nd. In only four days, they have built a route through the ice fall where it has taken some expeditions weeks. <laughs> but the top of the ice fall is hardly the summit of Mount Everest. <laughs> so for the next three weeks, we made good progress. And a week after that, I was on my way to the summit. But then just below the 26,000 foot level, my lungs congested and I really had no choice but to go down. Uh, and my climbing partner, Chris, however, he went on and reached the top, uh, really in, in hurricane wind conditions. But with that, the expedition was over and I started the long journey down the mountain and then back home. And, and I wondered if I had it in me to be a high altitude mountaineer. If I tried another big mountain, would I have the same issues happen with my lungs that, that happened on Everest? Well, I had a chance to find out uh, a little over a year later when I got a call from Jim Whitaker, my boyhood hero. And Jim was leading an expedition to K2, the second highest peak on the planet. And you know, today it's regarded as the hardest high altitude mountain in the world to climb. And um, when people point that out to me, sometimes they say, well, you know, it's a good thing we didn't know that back then. But um, even the trek to base camp was hard. It was uh, 110 miles with over 450 porters carrying our supplies for the nearly four months that the trek and the climb together would take. And then after a couple of weeks, we rounded a corner and, and there it was in the distance, K2, like this giant pyramid. And we started trekking up the glacier and, and the fear that I had on, on Everest came back. And I remembered my lungs getting congested and I felt that uncertainty not knowing if that would happen again. And, even if I stayed healthy, there was just the challenge of the mountain itself. Well, we set up base camp and the weather held and, and we started up. There were 14 of us on the team and unlike Everest, there were no Sherpas on this one. So we set up camp one and, and then camp two and some of the team carried supplies while others pushed the route further up the mountain. And we were now ready for this, the knife edge, a ridge about a mile long with an average altitude of 23,000 feet, but we only managed to get started when the weather turned. And at first we stayed in our high camp, hoping the storm was gonna be short, but we were using food and fuel that we really worked hard to carry up. And after four days, we had no choice but to go all the way down to base camp. And the storm lasted a week, but when it cleared, we had to work hard to get back to our previous high point. And finally, we were ready for the knife edge, which was also the precise border between Pakistan and China. And after four days, we, we got to the other end of the ridge, but there was no obvious place to set up the next camp. So we didn't have any choice but to hack the top of the ridge off and make platforms for our tents. And, and the tent walls just kind of conformed precisely with the ridge. So you actually had to climb through each tent to get from one end of camp to the another. But before we could move uh, past or higher above that camp, another storm hit. And once again, no choice but to 
lower all the way down the ropes to our base camp. And, and this storm lasted another week. Uh, and then it finally cleared and we climbed back up the ropes and, and it took over three days to dig out all the tents. And, and looking up now, we still had the summit head wall in front of us and tempers were, were getting thin and, and so was the food supply. We had been on the mountain for over a month. We pushed up to the next camp at 25,000 feet, but we only arrived there and another storm hit. And once more, we had to lower all the way back down to base camp. And this one lasted uh, another week. And with every day that passed, uh, my optimism and my teammates' commitment seemed to wane. But then it cleared and there were four of us selected to make a 11th hour attempt on the top. And we were nearly out of food and supplies. So we put in one more camp at the 26,000 foot level. And then the next day with the weather holding really well, uh, we started up and, and the climbing was, was pretty hard, especially in this section uh, called the bottleneck at about 27,000 feet where we had to climb a uh, steep rock covered with ice. Uh, and we'd also decided to try and climb the mountain without oxygen, which was no one had ever done before at that point. So each step took, I mean, just really concentrated effort. Uh, but finally, I reached the summit. Uh, this is the photograph that's on the cover of the book. It was a, a really perfect day. Couldn't have been better weather, but I was so exhausted. I, I just had to keep telling myself that this was supposed to be an important moment. And somehow I needed to not just appreciate it, but try to even remember it. Because all I could think about was how to get down. And indeed, the descent took us five days. Uh, but uh, getting into one camp, in fact, um, I literally had to crawl the last 100 feet. I couldn't even walk on my feet. But finally, we reached base camp, and we were greeted by our comrades and friends. And at this point, we'd been above 18,000 feet for, for 68 days in a row. And it had taken everything I had in me to do it. And I'd lost over 30 pounds. I was so skinny that I could actually pinch my fingers around my biceps. And on the summit day, uh, in the pre-dawn when we left camp, it had been uh, about 40 below zero. And, and uh, I had got frostbite on my fingers, uh, but fortunately nothing had to be amputated. And, um, but you know, we, we had made it. We, it was only the third ascent of K2 and we'd done it by a new route. In fact, nobody's ever repeated that route in all that time since. We climbed the hardest high altitude mountain in the world and and, you know, we'd done it one step at a time, and I was back in the game. Uh, then uh, a couple years later, uh, in 1980, I was invited to the People's Republic of China. And this was the first year that China opened its doors to foreign mountaineers. And I was part of a team that included uh, Yvonne, Yvonne Schoenard, who by then was a really close friend. And we were going to a region in eastern Tibet no Westerner had been to in over 50 years. And we were going to attempt this mountain, a 25,000 foot peak called Minyakonka. It had only been climbed twice ever. And it was my kind of trip to a remote region, uh, a little explored place with a good team of close friends, and including one named Jonathan Wright, who was also my business partner because we were a writer photographer team. And things were going okay until one day at 20,000 feet, we were we were caught in an avalanche, uh, swept down the mountain over 1,500 vertical feet. And I was sure there was no way I was gonna get out of it alive. But then the snow slowed and, and stopped. And I was injured, but not as badly as, as the others, and especially not as badly as, badly as Jonathan. And I, I tried to keep him alive, but after a half hour, he, he died uh, in my arms while I was while I was holding him and, and we buried him under a mound of rocks next to where he died and, and we went home. And I went into a, a really deep introspection. Should I keep climbing? And I didn't know if I could. And it took me a, a couple of years to think it through, to think about what I'd learned, what I'd taken from the high elevations and brought down to my life at sea level. I, I thought about how you learn on a climb to make a plan, but inevitably stuff goes wrong and you have to learn to adjust. <clears throat> you know, I thought about 
<clears throat> tenacity about how on a big mountain like K2, uh, you know, you get to the top, like I said, knowing how to just keep putting one foot in front of the other. And maybe the most important lesson, the one that was easiest to ignore because it seemed the most banal, but in truth, I think it's actually the hardest to learn because it's also the most omnipresent. And, and it's that was how, it's how the, the real goal isn't the summit, but it's the footsteps it takes to get there. And those were just a few of the lessons I'd learned over the years. But, but after that avalanche, after Jonathan had died and, and I thought I was going to die, I realized I had deeply changed. And sometimes I was waking up, you know, just amazed simply to be alive. And I remember one day walking from my car to the office and stopping in the parking lot and just standing there to feel the difference between the side of my face that was in sunshine and the other side that was in shadow. And, and in a way, I realized I was feeling like I'd been reborn with a, a new awareness of what it meant, what it really meant just to be alive. And, and that with that new awareness, um, I was really aware of how quickly any of us can not be alive. A few years later, after this introspection, I, I ran into that famous poem by Mary Oliver, uh, the one called Summer's Day with its famous last line that really summarized the challenges I was going through when she challenged all of us. And she said, tell me what you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. And that was it. Uh, and that included the decision whether I was gonna go back to climbing, but meanwhile, I had my professional life working as a writer and filmmaker and photographer and, and Jonathan's family uh, asked me to complete a story for National Geographic that he and I had been working on about the newly chartered Mount Everest National Park. And I decided to do it uh, for Jonathan and his wife and, and his baby daughter who was only a year old when he died. So I returned to Kathmandu and I was in the bar at the Yak and Yeti Hotel when I uh, saw a woman uh, in the lobby and, and I bought her a drink and she wanted to know where I lived. And, and I said, well, I've got a, a quaint beach cottage just south of Santa Barbara. And uh, the reality was that I lived in the surfer shack on a low rent beach uh, just north of Oxnard, but, but the line worked. And less than a year later, Jennifer and I married uh, in the Biltmore in Santa Barbara. And I'd come to realize that it wasn't a coincidence that I'd made this shift in my life so soon after Jonathan had died in my arms and, and so soon after I'd nearly died myself. And it wasn't a chance that Jennifer and I started our family right away, but, but that made it even more difficult to decide whether I was gonna to return to mountaineering. But mountaineering was what I did. And, and so much of who I had become was from my time in the mountains in nature. And now even with a family, I had to keep asking if the rewards were worth the risk. And what if the right people with the right project did come along, would I consider going back? And what would Jennifer think if I did? Well, then it happened. Uh, and I got a call from these two guys that Michael mentioned at the beginning of uh, our evening, uh, Dick Bass on the left, <clears throat> who owned the Snowbird Ski Resort and Frank Wells on the right, who at that time was the president of Warner Brothers. And by coincidence, they learned they both shared a lifelong dream to climb the, try and climb the highest mountain on each of the seven continents. And they didn't have much climbing experience at all. Uh, they were both nearly 50 years old. Um, I kind of wrote them off at first as just two guys having a midlifer, but they would need guides and they needed help organizing the expeditions. And they invited me to join any of the seven climbs. So I asked Jennifer what she thought. And, and she said, well, you know, maybe the bigger risk is, is not going you know, not staying true to who you are and, and maybe just as importantly, not meeting new people. She explained that, she told me that even though I would be guiding Frank and Dick on the climbs that, you know, maybe they could in turn guide me in, in some new directions. Well, it wasn't the first time I realized that in a marriage, one plus one can be a whole lot more than two. So I decided to go on three of the seven summit expeditions, starting with Aconcagua, the 
highest peak in South America. And, and all of us made the summit, including Yvonne, who was along. <laughs> and from there, I went to Everest. But this time, uh, instead of being a guide, uh, my role was uh, as the, uh, hold on. My role was as the color commentator for a television special uh, filmed on the expedition. And the trip was successful, but Frank and Dick missed the summit. And even though Dick came really close, but that didn't stop them. They went on and climbed the highest peaks in North America and Africa and Australia. And here you see them on the top of Mount Elbrus in the Transcaucasus and uh, the former Russia or Soviet Union. Uh, and the last on the list was uh, Vincent Massif, the highest mountain in Antarctica. And I joined again as a guide and we were the first private expedition ever to reach the interior of Antarctica. And we all made the summit. And this is a shot of me on top uh, on what was only the third ascent of Vincent, only the third time it had ever been climbed. But Frank and Dick had, had missed Everest. And even though Frank had to go back to work, uh, Dick went back to Everest. And at age 55, he reached the summit, becoming the first guy to climb the seven summits. And back at base camp, he called me on the satellite phone. He said, Rick, it just goes to show you that the second half, and I knew that, that was his shorthand for life after 50, the second half can be and should be the best half. So they were inspiring me, just like Jennifer had predicted. Uh, and maybe I was their guide, but you know, they were guiding me to inspiring me with a, a new confidence uh, to live my life in, in the wild places of the world. And also I had to commit to being there at the same time for my family between the trips. And, and that wasn't easy at all. And it wasn't always smooth. And if it hadn't been for Jennifer uh, there, who really had two jobs, uh, one with the kids and one at Patagonia, uh, I never would have lived this life, uh, filming photography and writing about living life wild. Uh, that was how I, I made my living but it wouldn't have happened without her support. But I was doing it not just in the mountains, but in other wild places, uh, including jungles, where on this trip, we made the first crossing of Borneo at its widest. Uh, 800 miles as the hornbill flew, but following the rivers, it was probably a lot closer to 2,000 miles. Uh, and on a, another jungle adventure, our objective was a secluded granite spire that rose 2,000 feet out of the Amazon in a region uh, of the Amazon, uh, 80 miles beyond the last Yanomami village. And, and that was a village that had been visited by anthropologists only in the, in the last decade. And we hired several of these Yanomami to help us carry our gear. And one day, one of them dropped his pack and headed into the forest. And I followed him, realizing he had heard a troop of monkeys. And he stopped. And from a distance, I saw him calling to make the monkeys curious. And sure enough, they came in for a closer look and, and he, he drew his arrow and shot and missed. But the image stuck in my head, like a song you can't get rid of. And, and finally I realized what it was. It was because this was the image of, of who I used to be. Well, there were more adventures, including one in Africa, climbing Kilimanjaro, the highest peak on that continent. But the summit was where the trip only started. From the top, we walked 500 kilometers due east all the way to the Indian Ocean, crossing the bushlands of the twin Savo National Parks that together the size of Israel. And it was a 500 kilometer trek and on foot at eye level the whole way with animals that put you a few rungs down the food chain. And that caused me to reflect on conservation efforts around the world to save wildlands and wildlife. And, and that led to an expedition that used my outdoor skills to help save a species called the shiru, an antelope looking creature that actually is a goat that lives in the most remote margins of the Tibetan plateau. And the animals were endangered because poachers were killing them for their fur that was woven into expensive shawls that had become a fashion hit. And, the biologists were concerned that if the poachers discovered the Shiru's calving grounds, it would be game over for this endangered species. And they knew that each summer the females migrated to an unknown place to have their babies. And they knew uh, they, need, they wanted to discover where it was uh, to persuade the Chinese to protect it uh, before the poachers could get there. But uh, it was 
so remote, they'd never been able to get there themselves. So I got my climbing buddies and we followed the migration on foot, carrying our supplies and custom made rickshaws. Uh, we had to walk nearly 300 miles and at the, at the start each cart weighed about 275 pounds. And the average elevation was 16,000 feet. And after a couple of weeks uh, of more calories going out than uh, went in, even Conrad, Conrad Anker, uh, who's probably one of the toughest climbers in the world was, was feeling it. Uh, that's Conrad flat out on his back. But after three weeks, we finally found a high snow dusted plateau with thousands of these animals congregating in a place where nobody could bother them there to have their babies. And we documented the calving grounds and we wrote an article and made a movie for National Geographic and the publicity convinced the Chinese to create a protected area around the calving grounds. And since then, the, the Shiro have been increasing each year and the conservation of wildlife and wildlands after this was becoming increasingly important to me and in large part from what I was learning from my companions, especially uh, Yvonne Chouinard uh, on the right there and Doug Tompkins who had been close friends and climbing partners since the, the two of them since the early 1960s. And they'd also, as you guys all know, probably started iconic climbing and outdoor equipment companies. Uh, Doug began making sleeping bags and packs and parkas and jackets. And, and he called his new company, the North Face. And then a few years later, Yvonne started his own company that he called Patagonia. And that was a name he gave the company because of the adventure he and Doug had had when they were both still in their in their 20s uh, and drove that old van from Ventura all the way to Patagonia the place. And that trip had a huge influence on them. And in turn, it had an enormous in ripple effect on, on me and uh, all, all, all my buddies, uh, on our entire generation of, um, of climbers. And I'll let uh, Yvonne and Doug tell you just a tiny bit about it from this clip from a movie we made called 180 South. I picked up a 16 millimeter Bolex camera to record the trip. Loaded the car up with surfboards and climbing gear and took off for a 10,000 mile trip down south. I think from the time we decided to go, it was like two weeks before we went. We bought this old van and took off from Ventura. 1968, you got to remember the Pan American Highway was pretty wild. It, it was dirt road from Mexico City all the way south. It was like being in Montana, Wyoming 100 years ago. Here we're in a area that's the size of the whole American West, with no people. For those of us that grew up going out into the wilds of the world, where nature was basically untouched, we got into our souls a sense of beauty. That trip had a big influence on both Doug and I kind of set the course for what we're going to do later in life. For me, it was the best trip of my life. Well, the beauty of nature was a big influence on the design aesthetic of uh, for Doug and, and his wife, Susie, when they Doug sold the North Face and started uh, the women's wear company Esprit and built it into a billion dollar brand. But Doug was increasingly disillusioned with making a lot of stuff that nobody really needed. And when his marriage fell apart, he sold his half and moved to a remote part of Southern Chile and started buying wildlands to convert them into national parks. And then he fell in love with a woman named Chris McDivitt who ran Yvonne's company, Patagonia. And that's Chris on the right. And she was also one of my best friends. So she left Patagonia, the company to move to Patagonia the place to join Doug and the two of them would go on over the next 25 years to create over 16 million acres of new national parks in Chile and Argentina and 
make it the biggest conservation win by private individuals in the history of conservation. And I was privileged uh, along with Yvonne and other friends uh, to have a, a small part in the effort uh, from the beginning. Uh, and I was also about this time really fortunate to have a chance to join uh, Yvonne's company, Patagonia. And like my mentors, Doug and Yvonne, apply what I learned from years in nature as a climber and explorer to the to the way we ran the company because fundamentally the company is in business to use business as an agent for environmental protection. And as Yvonne said, his environmental mentor, David Brower, uh, once put it succinctly that we all need to remember there is no business on a dead planet. Well, at Patagonia, I also got to work with terrific people. Um, I know some of them are online watching this right now all committed to the same higher calling. And, and those people included uh, interns uh, that joined the company each summer to fill about 10 positions uh, from a pool of about 10,000 applicants so that getting into the uh, internship program at Patagonia was harder than getting into Harvard. But one year the interns included a young woman who was an active outdoor athlete who at the time had just turned 20, but she had been barely a year old when her father, Jonathan, had, had died in my arms after that avalanche in Tibet. And Jonathan had named her Asia after his favorite place in the world. And after we had buried him in that remote grave, uh, Yvonne and I had stayed in touch, seeing her every year or two as she grew up and trying to be fill in part-time fathers. And now she was an intern. And I knew before the summer was over, she was going to want to know more about her father because after he had died or her mother had shut his memory out of their lives and and sure enough she asked me if we could have a chat and I didn't hold back I I told her about her father about the avalanche about how I had held him giving him mouth to mouth trying to keep him alive and, and she thanked me but then said that wasn't the only reason she wanted to talk the other was that she had a favor she wanted me to take her to the mountain where her father had died to climb the flank and find his grave. And I told her I needed to think about it. So I, I went to Jennifer and asked her and, and she said, well, of course you're going because Asia is not asking you just to find her father. She's asking you to be her father. And I knew that if Jonathan had lived, he, he would have taken his daughter on some of his trips and, and those certainly would have included Asia, the place. So that's what Asia and I did. We journeyed to the Everest region where I had many Sherpa friends who had been Jonathan's friends who now became Asia's friends. And we went to Western Tibet and to mountains that had hardly been explored where we had to endure 60 mile an hour winds to climb a 21,000 foot peak that was unnamed and at least until that day, uh, completely unclimbed. And then in Eastern Tibet, we approached the flank of Minyakonka where her father had died and it had been 20 years and I wasn't sure I could find the grave, but finally on a high barren buttress, we, we did find it only now it had been disturbed probably by a snow leopard. So, so we gathered my friend's bones, his daughter and me, and we reburied him and strung fresh pair of flags over the grave. And after saying our own prayers and making our own thanksgivings, we started the long journey home. And the full trip, the full pilgrimage, it took over two months. And in that time, I, I shared with Asia the stories and, and the lessons from those stories that I knew her father would have shared with her. And there are many of the lessons I've shared with you this evening about how you have to make a plan, but know that stuff happens. So you need to change or, or adjust and how you get to the top one step at a time and how you need to go about your life knowing that it's not about the summit, but it's about those footsteps, that it's about the way that you get there, that in your work life, as well as your home life, your life has to have a purpose. And that purpose needs to be more than just about you, but it needs to be about how you can be more than just yourself. So knowing what you know now, I'll challenge 
all of you the way I challenged myself all those years before <clears throat> to tell me, to tell yourself what you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. Well, thank you so much for joining me uh, this evening and I'm going to stop sharing my screen, I think now, Michael. All right. And I'm back to you. <laughs> Welcome back. I, um, please uh, type in your questions uh, via the Q&A or the chat if you are on YouTube. But I have got a couple questions in the meantime. Um, the, the, the saying, commit, then figure it out. It's at the beginning of your book. And if you could talk a little bit about the background behind that, because, I mean, that's a motto of your life. It is. Uh, th that has guided me as much as, you know, anything I've learned uh, in the mountains that I took home. But I actually didn't learn that one in the mountains. I first saw it on a, on a, a, a card behind Doug Tompkins' desk at Esprit. And um, when, I, when I read it, I realized that, you know, that had been his motto. That's, that's how he had succeeded uh, as a business person, as a climber. Mm -hmm. That's the way he and Yvonne, too, went about things. So I tried to integrate that into my own life, and, and I did. Um, I, I learned how to do that. And uh, many years later, down in Patagonia, the place, uh, I was on a kayak trip with Doug. That's also part of the book because it ended in tragedy when uh, Doug and I in a double kayak um, got knocked over in, in a windstorm in really cold water. And it took a long time for us to get ashore. And by the time we got there, um, I was unconscious and, and Doug, Doug was dead. But mm. the day before that happened, um, you know, we were as joyful as we always were. Uh, we were on a, a break from our paddle trip and we had hiked inland to uh, look at a piece of property, uh, an old ranch that had been abandoned that uh, was for sale. And Doug was thinking about buying it to start yet another protected area. And he was looking through it using my binoculars. And he said, I don't know, Rick, he said, I got so much on the plate already. Chris and I have so many projects going. The budget's already stretched. I, I don't know if we can add another one. And I said, <laughs> Doug, you got to commit and then figure it out. And <laughs> he laughed, you know. And I, and and I said, you know, when I when I saw that on the sign behind your desk at Esprit, it really meant a lot to me. And and I've lived by it. And I said, what? Where did you come up with that one? And he said, oh, that one, I got that one from Napoleon. <laughs> so that's the full story of commit. And oh, my gosh. That's great. Um, you had mentioned earlier about the film 180 Degrees South, um, directed by Chris Malloy, another Ojai guy. Pretty amazing. The Malloy brothers are very accomplished. But you were part of that writing team of that movie, weren't you? Yeah, I was the executive producer. Um, when I was at Patagonia, Chris came to me with the idea to, to make a, a, a film inspired by uh, the trip that Doug and Yvonne had made climbing Fitzroy uh, that you saw that mm -hmm. little clip of back in the late 60s. And, um, and I loved the idea. So I partnered with him to be the, you know, the, the producer uh, to put mm -hmm. the film together. And then, and then I really did, we partnered too on a lot of the creative part of it, but, um, but yeah, I was very involved in it. Uh, and when, you know, I was along on the climb uh, uh, or on the, all the, exp the sailing trip, uh, part of the sailing trip down there and, uh, and part of the climbs. So yeah, had a lot to do with it. And I, um, I, I screened that movie to some friends over Thanksgiving just last week. Hadn't looked at it for years. We made it in 2008 and it was really cool. I really enjoyed mm -hmm. looking at it again. I think, it, I think it's held up pretty good. And everybody that looked at it uh, really loved it. it. It's been pretty successful. It was on Netflix for a lot time, a long mm -hmm. time. I think you can get it on Amazon and other places now. Uh, I think it's been downloaded between two and three million times now altogether. Wow. Wow. And it spawned some incredible, many incredible adventure movies. I mean, Jimmy's made the Oscar winner about Alex Holm. Uh, he made 
the equally spectacular May Rue. There's a lot of younger people that I feel that you've inspired to make these films. And if you could just speak to the quality of so many of these great movies now, I mean, one won an Oscar. Yeah. Well, Jimmy was on that rickshaw trip that um, I showed you guys. He was the young, we added him at the, at the last minute. We needed one more person to come along and he was the youngest of all of us. He was 29 years old then. And uh, he'd never made a movie and he would hardly shot a movie camera. He's a still photographer. So I said, you know, you're going to make the movie. And he goes, what? And I said, commit and then figure it out, Jimmy. (laughs) So on the long plane flight over, you know, we were kind of sleeping and reading our novels and Jimmy had to read the operating instructions for the Canon X1, but he did a great job. And, uh, and we made a movie of the trip and National Geographic, uh, you know, showed it around the world on their television channels. And it was really a, important uh, part of um, the effort to persuade the Chinese to create that protected area. Without Jimmy's film, it wouldn't have happened. Um, and it was a big break for him, but he took advantage of that. <laughs> I remember when I called him up to invite him on the trip, he told me later that as, that as, soon, as, I, uh, as soon as I made the invitation, he said to himself, oh my God, what did I do to deserve this? He was so excited. And then he told me about a, a week into the trip, pulling those 270 pound, five pound carts. He said to himself, what did I do to deserve this? <laughs> but as I said, he, um, he really took advantage of the opportunity, didn't he? Yeah. yeah, he did. And what I admire most about Jimmy is he seems, if you anybody's ever met him, you would agree that he has permanent stoke in his life. He's just always so up there. And yeah. That's the reason. So we have... Go, oh, ahead. go ahead. No, no you go. Reason, ahead. That's the reason we invited him because he, we all, had, those, anybody who had met him could feel that stoke. And, and we wanted him along because of that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Ruby wanted to know, uh, do you think there are still places that are relatively untouched by people like you found on your road trip in 1968? Well, first of all, Ruby, remember Yvonne and Doug went on that road trip. I was just a whippersnapper uh, back then. I just was just barely out of high school. <clears throat> Those guys were a little older than me. Um, but, you know, with them and other friends, uh, I was fortunate in the 80s and 90s um, to get into some really remote areas. Um, that rickshaw trip, uh, we crossed a 50 mile wide section that no Westerner had ever crossed in history. And uh, we confirmed that, we did the research because uh, there hadn't been that many people there. And I think that was kind of the last of the places on the world that were unknown. Um, I, you know, with uh, satellite, uh, you know, Google Maps and everything else now, there's, there's really no unknown regions. And I think, uh, Ruby, people from the younger generations can still find that same sense of wonder, um, you know, looking for, looking deeper into the places that on the surface are, are a little known. But as you dig down into the details of any place, um, you find more and more aspects of it that, that you didn't realize were there before. You can continue to discover, discover new things about any place uh, almost endlessly. <clears throat> Before we started this evening, Michael and I were chatting a little bit about uh, COVID and how I was telling him how, uh, for me, it, it, it forced me to stop flying, which was a real blessing because, uh, first of all, my carbon footprint was so high that, as Yvonne says, we're probably both going to go to hell just for that, for no other reason. But also, it made me explore my backyard, hiking into the hills behind Ojai, uh, and going deeper and deeper into the into the into the backcountry here, into this ecosystem. And I continue every day. I go back to learn more and more about it, and it and and I've got a sense of wonder about it. So that's been the mm. big discovery for me. Uh, that was the the silver lining uh, of this uh, lockdown that we've all suffered through for me personally. Mm. Mm. Um, that's a great answer. As far as uh, Paul wanted to know, and about you, you had said earlier that you had just found some of the footage of K2 and you just saw it for the first time in so many years. And he wanted to know what was your reaction after seeing the footage of K2 after all these years? Oh, it was really fun, Paul, to 
as it is for anybody listening here, I think when you see footage or, or, or photos of yourself at a young age that you maybe haven't seen for a long time and you just go, oh my gosh, that's me, isn't it? <laughs> so that's certainly fun. But, um, you know, it, there's an asp another thing that happens uh, is that they trigger memories uh, that you otherwise, you know, have buried in, in, your, in your memory bank someplace. They, they can, they're old footage like that. I, I looking at that footage, um, I could remember things uh, that happened, uh, you know, that I had uh, forgotten about. And so that, that mm. was, it was really a lot of fun for me, Paul, to see that footage. And, um, you know, I was, it was a pleasure to share a few of those clips with you guys tonight. As I said, they've, um, they've never been shown before publicly until, you know, I've, uh, until just recently. I, I saw it myself for the first time, maybe six weeks ago now. <clears throat> Wow. Wow. Um, and before, before, as we wrap this up, uh, before we, 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 we came on for everybody, you, we had talked about, you know, you retired from Patagonia two years ago, yet you're busier than ever. And yeah. if you could tell everyone I, what you've been involved with the last couple of years. Well, I told Michael that I, I'm, I think I'm working more than when I worked, uh, certainly writing the book and, you know, the, the work promoting it is taken, takes time. Of course, we all know that. But um, after I left the company, I, I doubled down on conservation, on uh, work I do with on the boards of several uh, conservation nonprofits. Um, Michael in the introduction uh, mentioned the Turtle Conservancy here in Ojai. Um, mm -hmm. I also work with a NGO called One Earth that um, is uh, developing uh, science to show actions that all of us can do to keep the planet to 1.5 degrees. It's a, a group uh, really committed to climate change solutions that are very realistic uh, because they all involve things that we're already doing. It's just doing more of it. So yeah. if any of you are interested in learning what you can do to help solve climate change, I invite you to go to oneearth.org and, and check that out. Um, the work I'm doing with these groups is just so fulfilling that um, I keep saying yes to everything they ask me to do. So, you know, I get up early and go to bed late. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we need your, your constant energy, Rick. I mean, it's just what you've done and what you continue to do is very important to this world. And we, you know, I can't personally can't thank you enough as everyone else for all the work you've done. Well, thank you, Michael. It's a really sweet of you to say that. And, and I think it's really cool that you wanted to finish, wait and finish the book until you heard me talking. I, that's really, a th I like that. Good for you. <laughs> well, Rick, thank you very much for joining us tonight. It was an, a, a wonderful evening. It was my pleasure, Michael. And I want to thank everybody uh, logging in tonight for attending as well. And thank you, everyone. And I will leave you with this thought before we sign off here. Oh, boy, you pulled that one out quickly. Thank you so yeah. much. <laughs> Words to live by, Rick. Thank you again. Be well. And everyone else, be well, too, during this holiday season. Thank you and good night. <laughs>